everybody, welcome back to day 12 of our 30 day EKG challenge. And I thought we would build upon yesterday's lecture on atrial flutter and dive into another variation, which is 221 atrial flutter, like we see here. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the physiology of atrial flutter a little bit further, um, and maybe a little bit of um, kind of building on that physiology and a little bit of the treatment, um, medical treatment and how that works. So I hope you enjoy and let's go from there. So when I look at this EKG, I notice a few things that are different. One, when I scan through, I notice there's a very rapid rate and it seems to be quite regular, right? I see QRSs that are firing off quite irregularly and they're occurring at a rate of, let's see, we have a QRS landing on a solid line there. We have a QRS landing just after a solid line there. So I know two, that would be 300, 150, probably just a little bit slower than 150. We'll say 140 beats per minute. So we have a regular complex tachycardia. So when we see a regular complex tachycardia, uh, we need to start forming a differential diagnosis, right? The approach to the EKG is important. We need to narrow down what's going on. We can't just look at it and go, that's it. There needs to be an anatomical rationale behind why we are choosing what we're choosing. So what's our differential for a narrow complex tachycardia? Well, we've got sinus tachycardia. We've got ectopic atrial tachycardia. We've got SVTs in the form of AV reentry tachycardia, AV nodal reentry tachycardia. We've got atrial flutter. So there are a lot of uh, rhythms, and we're gonna go into those this month, but there's a lot of rhythms that we need to work through. And so um, let's see how we can best work through this strip and come to our conclusion. So. Like I said, we've got a rapid regular complex tachycardia and I look and I notice that my QRS is narrow which helps me narrow this down to a supraventricular origin of that rhythm, right? So my QRS, QRS is less than 120 milliseconds or three small boxes. So it tells me that the rhythm is coming from the AV node or above. I look for regularity and it's regular. So I, I go through all these rhythms that we're talking about. I look for atrial activity before every QRS complex, and I notice that there seems to be some sharp deflections. And are those sharp deflections P waves? I look up here. I don't know if necessarily that's just a normal P wave, because I notice that there's this also. So I want, I want you guys to know sharp deflections. So if they, there's sharp deflections, when you're looking for atrial activity. So anytime the atrial depolarizes, it creates sharp depolarizations. Anytime that you see like the ST or T wave, those are more broad, right? So we need to look for sharper deflections within those ST and T wave segments. And I notice here, there's this other sharp deflection on that ST segment. So notice here, there's this sharp atrial activity before my QRS, and then there seems to be one right there. And then I look down at some of my other leads. I gotta scan through all of my leads, and I see here in lead three, I notice I've got these sharp deflections here, but I notice that there might be another sharp deflection kind of towards the end of the QRS. And so the, what, what it helps me kind of walk myself onto the atrial flutter is just scanning through all the leads and determining is there two to one atrial activity. Remember that atrial flutter with two to one conduction, those flutter waves, the flutter waves are usually 250 to 300 beats per minute, the rate. So if my flutter waves, flutter, 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 are 250 to 300 beats per minute, that tells me that my QRS response, my ventricular response is going to be half of that because it's every other beat is being conducted to the QRS. So I should have a rate of 125 to 150 beats per minute if this is two to one atrial flutter, which would be one, we have that. So that increases my suspicion. Two, I notice here V1, so V1, just so you all know, V1 is a great lead to look for flutter waves because V1 usually has a nice flat baseline and has nice sharp flutter waves. And I noticed that there's certainly a wave 
here. So here, let's draw my QRSs. There's my QRS, right? We may have like a incomplete right bottom branch block here. We're not gonna focus on that, but regardless, notice I've got this hump here, that's atrial activity, right? We see all these atrial activities. But I see this little hump peeking out of my QRS complex. I see this little hump peeking out from my QRS complex. And if you notice, that creates kind of a marching through pattern here in V1. So that would be a flutter wave, flutter wave, flutter wave. And notice that there's two flutter waves for every one QRS. And those flutter waves are occurring at about twice the rate of my H, uh, ventricular rate. So this is a, occurring at a rate of roughly 280 beats per minute. And then when I look back at some of these leads, like lead two, I want you to see the flutter waves marching through the rhythm. So look at this. Here's a flutter wave. And we have another one, two. And do you see these flutter waves just marching through the rhythm? It's, it's going to be difficult in this case because two to one atrial flutter, which means that every two flutter waves produce one QRS, right? Here's one, two, and then a QRS. One, two, and then a QRS. One, two, and then a QRS. Two to one flutter is very difficult because what's also occurring after these nice QRS complexes is they have a T wave as well. And so our flutter waves are occurring at the same time as that ST and T wave. So, two to one atrial flutter, what's actually going on? Well, remember we said that the tricuspid valve, which sits here in between the right atria and the right ventricle, is most commonly the spot of a reentry pathway within the atria. For these flutter waves to produce atrial depolarization at a rate of roughly 300 beats per minute, there's this fast reentry pathway that occurs. Right, I'm gonna do it in red. There's a fast reentry pathway here around the tricuspid annulus, and every time it sends signal through the atria and depolarizes the atria, that produces our flutter waves. So we have goes around in the circle, produces the flutter wave. Then it goes around in the circle again, and it produces the flutter wave. And remember, this all occurs at that flutter wave rate of 250 to 300 beats per minute, right? And every time a flutter wave gets sent across, every time we get this flutter wave that depolarizes across the atria, the AV node that sits right here, the AV node actually gets bombarded with that signal at that rate. So the AV node is getting bombarded at 250 to 300 beats per minute by these flutter waves. And its job is to send the signal down to the ventricles, right, and cause a QRS complex. Well. The AV node, we know, every time it depolarizes, it also has to repolarize. It's refractory. So the AV node is not going to conduct every single one of those. In this case, though, when we notice that there are, if I look down, we'll kind of refocus ourselves over here. Notice that there are one, two flutter waves for QRS. One, two flutter waves for QRS. That means that every other flutter wave is being captured by the AV node here, and it gets sent down and it depolarizes the ventricles. So that's why we call this two to one conduction. Two to one meaning two flutter waves, flutter waves per one QRS complex. So when we're, when we're talking about atrial flutter and we're dialing in what's the conduction ratio, that's what the two to one means, this is actually a representation of the AV node. The AV node. So we always talk about, well, what's my approach to the EKG? My approach is going from anatomical. What's the atria doing? What's the AV node doing? What's the ventricle doing, right? What's my QRS morphology? And so on and so forth. And so in two to one atrial flutter, we're saying that every two flutter waves then will produce one QRS complex. So right now my AV node is um, doing a pretty good job of conducting the flutter waves, right? Yesterday was four to one conduction. You can have also a three to one conduction. You can have five to one conduction. You can have variable conduction, which means that maybe one time it'll do two to one, then it'll do three to one, then it'll do two to one, then it'll do four to one. It kind of jumps around because sometimes the AV node's a little bit unpredictable in the sense that it's not perfectly precise every single time, but it's well in the ballpark. So here, 
you can notice that the AV node is conducting every two uh, flutter waves through the QRS complex. And it's producing a tacky arrhythmia, right? This is fast. It's 140 beats per minute and it's regular. There's something else that I want you to understand is that because this is an atrial arrhythmia, anything that is at, that occurs in an EKG that is at or below the AV node needs to be evaluated independently, right? So all of this QRS morphology needs to be evaluated independent of the atrial arrhythmia. Because the atrial arrhythmia is happening up here in the atria, and signals getting sent down to the ventricles, we need to evaluate that independently. So you're gonna look for that width of the QRS. You're gonna look for the QRS axis. You're gonna look for the R wave progression. You're gonna look for bundle branch blocks. All those things can happen in these atrial arrhythmias because this is all happening in the atria. The AV node's a bystander and is just taking that signal, conducting it down the ventricles in a normal fashion for this individual. And so when I see atrial flutter two to one, and I know that the two to one conduction is creating a rapid arrhythmia, right? No one needs to be living at a heart rate of 140 beats per minute. That's too fast. Heart's working way too hard. My heart rate right now is probably 60, right? So is yours. And so we need to make sure that we decrease this rate. And so let's talk about some of the tenets of the core kind of treatment options of decreasing the rate Right, we're not gonna change the rhythm, we're gonna just change the rate here. So this is more rate control versus rhythm control. There's two different things when you think about treating these atrial arrhythmias. Rhythm control means how can I get them out of atrial flutter and into a sinus rhythm? And rate control is how can I control the rate of this rhythm so that this patient um, is hemodynamically stable and can maintain good cardiac function, cardiac output. So we said that the, the amount of flutter waves that get sent down to the QRS is a function of the AV node. So if I want to decrease this rate to say 100 beats per minute or 80 beats per minute, something normal, what do I need to do? I need to, I need to slow down, I need to slow down the AV node, right? If I can slow down the conduction through the AV node, it can then produce maybe a four to one rhythm, right? So what are some things that slow the AV node down? Well, the AV node we know is supplied by um, our sympathetic nervous system, right? There are sympathetic fibers that come through and they supply the um, kind of activating features of the AV node, right? That's our sympathetic nervous system. So things that block the sympathetic nervous system or block our adrenergic receptors or um, specifically beta adrenergic receptors would be a beta blocker. Remember beta blockers in an lol, right? Metoprolol, bisoprolol, carvedilol, labetalol. Um, and there are some that are more selective for the beta receptors that are within the myocardium, specifically beta one. Um, and so if we give a beta blocker an atrial flutter with two to one conduction, what will likely happen is our AV node will be suppressed a little bit more. And so then that two to one conduction will kind of broaden out to three to one, four to one, five to one, right? You can also recognize that if the patient can't take a beta blocker, there are also medications that are calcium, calcium channel blockers. There are certain calcium channel blockers that work really well. We have a few different classes of calcium channel blockers. There's calcium channel blockers that are more selective for the heart, and there's calcium channel blockers that are more selective for your vasculature, right? Because vas vessels, if you block calcium channels, you get vasodilation, so you can treat them with hypertension, medications like amlodipine. But within the myocardium, we actually know that the AV node is calcium channel dependent. So the AV node is calcium dependent, right? If you look at that pacemaker potential, it's calcium channel dependent. So what's really interesting is you can give calcium channel blockers. Most commonly are diltiazem and verapamil, verapamil. 
And those calcium channel blockers will do something very similar. It'll decrease the speed in which the AV node can transmit signal. And so you can decrease the conduction velocities through the AV node itself, which would then maybe decrease my ventricular response. So what I want you to really understand from what I'm talking about with some of these treatment options for slowing the AV node down, these are just a few. There's, a, there's certainly more. But it's the idea that selecting for medications that will preferentially slow down the AV node is what's going to then control the rate of these atrial flutters with two one conduction. And then what ends up happening is you can slow the rhythm down and you can get something like this where you go to your four to one atrial flutter. Remember yesterday's EKG where all of a sudden we have four to one atrial flutter? Notice here if I zoom in that I've got one, two, three, four flutter waves for one QRS. One, two, three, four flutter waves for QRS. That tells me that my AV node is conducting slower. So, alrighty. I hope that helps. Uh, if you have questions about atrial flutter, let me know. We're going to be continuing down our atrial arrhythmias pathways uh, for the next few days, and I'm really excited. I uh, hope this helps, and have a good rest of your day. Take care.